Welcome to Final Element Methods. We'll be discussing history and motivation. While we're doing Final Elements, what, what's, what, what is the learning that we need to do? So what is a Final Element Method? The Final Element, final element Method or Final Element Analysis is an approximation technique for discrete numerical solution of continuum field equations. So it allows you to solve partial differential equations for a unknown quantity, which could be a function of several spatial variables or time dependent variables. Final elements can be applied to heat transfer, solid mechanics, fluid mechanics, electricity, magnetism, coupled physics, and many other problems. On the right hand side, I show some of the variables of interest you could have. For example, for heat transfer, temperature could be of interest. Solid mechanics, displacements could be of interest. And for fluid mechanics, you could be interested in velocity fields. And then you could also have uh, many other situations like moisture diffusion problems, moisture concentration could be the field of interest. But final method provides a way of discretizing the solution. Now, these this, this problems, this governing equation for these problems tend to be continuum problems, right? There are infinite number of points in the domain. And what we're trying to do, we're trying to find ways to discretize that domain in a way that we can then solve it, um, in a way that we can solve it in an easy way, right? Because solving partial differential equations, if you recall from your differential equation class, some of those equations had exact solutions. But in reality, finding those exact solutions for say a differential equation that applies to an airplane or something more complicated in terms of boundaries will be significantly more difficult. As a consequence, you can use finite elements to then solve it approximately. So what is the motivation of finite elements? Uh, it allows you to solve real problems. You can have complicated geometries, complicated material properties, but the final element has all these features that may not be available in other approximation tools. It can be applied to any field problem that has a governing equation of some kind. And you don't even have to have a physical problem. It could be a mathematical problem. It can facilitate modeling complicated geometries. It can facilitate the application of boundary conditions and loads. And it can lead and deal with any type of material response. The beautiful thing about finite elements is that it looks like the original structure. The structure you end up with when you look at it in the screen looks like original structure. And to increase the accuracy of the solution, all we have to do is increase the mesh density. <coughs> so what is the goal is in solid mechanics, if you, if you were to apply to solid mechanics, is to find the deformation. So I apply a load to this CAD model. I create a mesh and then apply a load. Well, the goal is to compute the deformations, the strains and stresses, and the fader loads. That is the goal. We want to determine where the structure is likely to break, because that's the area I want to beef up so it can take the loads in, in, in service. And in this case, this component is for launch vehicle design. You can see here that load was applied, and here there's this heat, hot spot, we call it hot spot because the stresses are the highest here. The beautiful thing about finite elements is that we can post process the results in a way we can visualize it. We can visualize the stress field, we can visualize the strain field, we can understand what is going on. Complicated problems can involve material nonlinearities and geometric nonlinearities. Non like contact conditions can be very difficult to implement. Uh, you could have large scale deformations and plasticity. The goal is to compute the deformation stress and fader load. Now, let me show, and I'll go through this later, a typical partial differential equation in solid mechanics looks like this. You have the equilibrium equation of elasticity, where sigma here is a stress field. X is a spatial domain, X1, X2, and X3. You may be more used to X, Y, and Z. BI is the body forces, U is the deflections, U, V, and W, or U1, U2, and U3, in the three corresponding three axes, X1, X2, and X3. T is the time domain. 
So I can use this equilibrium. I have to solve these equilibrium equations. There's three equations here. And the unknowns that you see here are six stresses and you have three deflections that are unknown. Then you have the constitutive law. I don't wanna confuse you with all these indices, but the bottom line is that the stress is related to the strain through six equations. And how do you find this constitutive matrix? How do you find the relationship of stress to strain that is found through doing experiments. With the experiments, you can find them. How many unknowns I have here? I have six stresses and six strains, and they are related through the constitutive law. The strain deflection relationship, epsilon ij, is one half of this equation you see here is for nonlinear. And you can see that I can relate strain to deflections through that relationship, and that u is the variable of interest, again, the deflections. The strain is also known. I have six strain unknowns. I have three deflection unknowns. So I have how many equations I have? I have six equations here. That's an error. Six equations here, six equations here, three equations here. And I have six stresses that are unknown, six strains that are unknown, and three deflections that are unknown. I have 15 equations and 15 unknowns that have to be solved in a highly complex, complicated domain, like a golf club. One of the modelings I've done in the past is the finite element of a golf club. That's a complicated domain. Finite element of a launch vehicle. That's a complicated domain. Finite element of an aircraft. That's a complicated domain. I can probably solve it for a little cube, little very simple cube, but to solve that over a complicated domain is a lot more difficult. And so you have to go ahead and try to solve these equations in a way that's tractable. And one approach is to substitute the bottom equation into the top equation so everything is in terms of deflections. And then substitute this equation into the top equation, so everything's in deflections. And now everything's in terms of deflections, but it's highly coupled. That's the point. But what if I show you the blueprint to success? The blueprint that was gonna open your eyes and say, wow, you know, I used to solve differential equations. I used to solve partial differential equations. But now I have a different way of doing it that's more, even more general. So let's open your eyes towards this approach that's exciting because it can solve real problems they can encounter in real life. We want to formulate systematic solutions. What we, what we want in a code, in a fundamental code, what I want is a systematic way of solving a partial differential equation over a simple, over a domain. I need a systematic approach. And so the idea then is to come up and break up this very complicated problem into small pieces, small domains. They're repetitive in how they look like. There could be triangles, there could be, um, there could be line elements or square elements. But the bottom line is I wanna to try to solve the equation of a very simple domain. That's, that's, that's the goal. And if I can do that and, and create that, then perhaps I can discretize the geometry that I have, for example, if I have this geometry on the left, a CAD model of that with a circular hole, perhaps I can take that and I can discretize the domain using elements that look like each other. And here I use triangular elements to discretize this domain. Well, if I can solve or at least pose the problem so that the locations where these elements connect are the known unknowns, perhaps I have a way of solving this in a faster way, a more efficient way, then try to come up with an analytical solution that's actually not very easy to find for a plate with a hole. And I have the analytical solution for this in one of my YouTube videos, and you can see that the complication of, sol of solving the analytical solutions is, is, is very, very difficult. So finite elements can be very helpful in do helping you with that. The beautiful thing is that once I discretize this domain into small elements, small domains, I call these small domains. Uh, these small subdomains are called elements, each of these little things. And they're connected with each other using nodes. But now I can apply boundary conditions. So say I wanna apply a load to this CAD model on this edge to apply a load to the right and the left-hand side is fixed. Well, perhaps what I can do is fix the left-hand side and apply a load to the right-hand side. And here, what you see is that I can apply those loads directly into your finite element model 
and I can fix the domain on the left hand side in the final model by fixing these nodes and then applying loads to each of these nodes. I can configure the model by applying the material properties, perhaps a steel or aluminum. I can apply those properties to that. And that's beautiful. We call this pre-processing, all this stuff. This step, this step is pre-processing, this step is pre-processing. And now what I can do is when I apply the idea of fine elements uh, to this problem, what I'll find is something very, very, like what I call a mathematical miracle. And there'll be some mathematical miracles discussed in this class, but this is one of them. I, I took a complicated set of equations that are partially, they're coupled, partially coupled maybe, but these are partial differential equations that are highly coupled potentially. And these equations, when you apply a finite element, will turn the problem into linear algebra. A stiffness matrix multiplied by deflections equals the force. And that's a mathematical miracle because we've now found a way of solving partial differential equations using linear algebra. Well, the force is known and the stiffness of the system will generally be known. So all I have to do is invert the K matrix, the stiffness matrix, and calculate deflections. Once I know the deflections, I know the strings. Once I know the strings, I know the stresses, and I can then design a structure to prevent failure from occurring. That's beautiful. That's an incredible idea that we have in our hands, a powerful tool that took a partial differential equation, and by simply approximating the solution, over a subdomain, which I'm calling elements, this little triangle. And every triangle looks like each other. I have now turned the problem into KU equals F. And that's a mathematical miracle. I can use it as these approaches to then post-process the results. Once I get deflections, I can plot it. I can visualize it. I can show where the stresses are the highest. I can show where the strains are the highest. I can show how it deflects. I can do the analysis statically or dynamically. That's beautiful. That's what Feynman provides you. It provides you a way, a tool to develop a solution to very complicated problems. Here's an example of a practical application. I have a CAD model that's made of, a, it's a CAD model of a structure. And this structure is going to be, is going to be a piece as a component level test for an aircraft application. So this structure needs to be good to go for design purposes. Well, this structure, first you have the CAD model. You take the CAD model and you can discretize the domain into smaller finite elements, into brick elements. We're using this kind of elements here. This one right here, brick elements. <clears throat> and here, this finite model, you can apply temperature and external loads. You can apply the, it's a composite structure, so you can apply stack and sequence and apply thicknesses. And once you have that, uh, you want basically to determine the properties of each of this stuff, the, the steel, the metal, the composite, the foam that's in there. And you may have to do some testing to characterize that. That's gonna help you identify critical failure modes and you wanna get the strength data for all the critical failure modes. Once you have that, you incorporate that into your final model to then plot the stresses and determine whether the structure could fail or not. You also want to validate the final element against testing. And this is called verification validation. I want to make sure the analysis matches the test to the best of the abilities. And you, once you validate the model, you can then write margin of safety, and then you can apply a factor of safety to evaluate the margin of safety of the structure. So that is a general idea on how to use this concept. So what is the basic idea? The basic idea is to break up the continuum domain. And in this case, we're breaking up this CAD model into small pieces into discrete subdomains, each with a simple geometry, finite elements, and they're connected with each other using nodes. You can see here there's cross sections or connecting elements. Uh, for example, here you have these two triangular elements being connected. Well, they're connected via nodes. We want to approximate the solution of the partial differential equation over each subdomain 
by interpolating among a discrete number of nodal values. So we're going to try to figure out a way of approximating solutions so that the unknowns of the approximation function that we select is such that the nodal values are unknown. The locations over the elements, the location where the elements connect, that's where I don't know what the solution is. And then we apply the laws and binary conditions and then solve the system of equations. So here's an example of a continuum problem. You have here a vibrating string. Obviously here, there's a continuum problem and it has infinite number of unknowns. And that, that's a partial differentiated equation governing the behavior of this vibrating string. We can discretize this domain and one approach is to discretize it using springs. Well, if you were to use an approach like that, you have now a finite number of unknowns because I've discretized it into specific number of springs. I don't have infinite number of springs, I have a finite number of springs. As a consequence, the words finite elements come from two things. Finite because I have a finite number of springs. And second, the word element because we're calling these subdomains, these little divisions, partitions, we're calling those elements. They make up the larger set, which is a full model. And this is going to then turn the problem into a, a linear algebra or nonlinear algebra problem by doing that. Here's an application of finite element model to an aircraft. In a finite element model of an aircraft, it's going to be large. These elements, uh, these models will be very large. So if you were to work on a project like this, you may be assigned a particular section of this aircraft to model it, and then later somebody else will assemble it into a larger scale airplane model. But these are subcomponent models, and within each model, you're going to have a discretization that's done uh, to the element level. Here's a model for a American Airlines Flight 587 accident investigation. And here, what we have is a finite element model that was used in this investigation with a mesh density that's much finer in the area where failure occurred. And that's the beauty of finite elements. You can use a coarse mesh, whatever you don't think you need it, and a finer mesh to increase accuracy in areas where you actually do need it. And I invite you to go ahead and download this paper because you'll learn a lot about how this works. Here's the application of fine elements to its bolted joint design. You can see a coarse mesh is being used far away from the area of interest and a fine mesh is used in the area of interest. And here we model the contact between the bolt and the composite and you even model the washers and everything that goes along with it. The models like this may be required to understand the physics of failure as a whole. But models like that could also be simplified by maybe using hand calculations. It depends what you're after. If you're trying to look for an accurate, highly accurate result, then a finite element model is required. Now, creating a mesh everywhere that's that fine is impractical. So maybe you use a coarse mesh far away and you attach it to a finer mesh using some sort of constraint at that boundary. Because obviously, if this, not, if this side of the structure moves, this side of the structure also should move it about the same amount, and that makes total sense. Here is an application of uh, penetration of the airplane wing. And you can see here that the modeling is quite complicated. Here they're modeling failure of this airplane wing due to this uh, impact penetration event. Here's a model of a space shuttle, solid rocket motor aft skirt splashdown which uses an Eulerian approach to solve it, or a fluids type approach to solve it. And you can see here how the COPV or this, or this space shuttle uh, structure with this tank is going to impact um, some sort of splashdown or, or the ocean. 
And you can see how the time is being simulated, how we're simulating this over time. And that how, how this, this pressure vessel could, could be deformed due to this loading event. Large critical projects. I really like the question that has been asked and, and I want this to be uh, captured. So the question is, if I have, I'm using materials into a structure and that material says aluminum 6061 or something like that, where we know test data is available for it, there you could use uh, something called the MMPDS and you'll be experiencing some of that in some of the work you'll be doing. Um, generally speaking, the analysis that you're going to be doing is going to be done in a way that has to be high confidence. So if the aluminum alloy you're interested in, the data for it is not available in fully comprehensive manner, then you have to perform additional testing to gain confidence in that. Secondly, you need to figure out, for example, for composite materials, composite materials tend to be manufacturing sensitive. While a lot of data exists in the literature, such as iGate and NCAMP, NCAMP databases, one needs to be careful because composite materials tend to be sensitive to your manufacturing procedures. And so it's very important that when you're modeling large scale structures, that we be careful about using um, using open source data into your models. So it depends on the level of confidence where the material data came from and how applicable the material data is to your actual design. For pre preliminary design, I think you can start by maybe using some of that data that's in open literature in the conceptual phases, because maybe you don't have all the ability, you don't have all the data available right now at that point in time, but uh, you may want to carry an uncertainty factor to account for the fact that you don't have everything straight yet. And hopefully, once the material data is collected, you don't have to redo anything again. The history, the history of final element method is, um, it started with a framework method that uh, was formulated using 2D structural problems as an assembly of bars and beams. In 1943, Richard Courant approximated the torsion rigidity of hollow shaft by dividing the cross section to triangles and linearly interpolating the stress function over each triangle. He suggested that a wide generalization can be, can be adopted for this problem to other problems uh, because it provides great flexibility the way he did it. And it seems to be, and he found it was of considerable practical value. In 1956, Turner derived stiffness matrices for truss and beams. In 1960, Ray Clough coined the term fine element. For a few years, new elements are introduced based on intuition and physical hand waving. And then you saw the first applications of structure analysis. 1963, FE gained respect from mathematicians and it was recognized as a form of rather risk. Late 60s and early 70s, computer programs for finite elements emerged, and today simulations involving millions of degrees of freedom are routine. The strategy for the finite element implementation is going to follow the following approach. You're going to have a physical problem that's given to you. It could be heat transfer, solid mechanics, moisture diffusion, fluid mechanics, whatever it is, you have that real physical problem. And the first step is to idealize that physical problem. You wanna choose what details to include and omit. You may not wanna model every single small hole in a structure. You may not wanna model every single nitty gritty detail that may not affect the overall behavior of the structure. You also have to select what simulation procedure you want. You may, you may wanna, you know, not naturally you may wanna model everything time dependent because maybe the law is applied time dependent. So you have to model everything time dependent. But maybe there is a simplification to that because dynamic problems can be quite expensive. Time dependent problems can be quite expensive. So perhaps you could do a static model instead. You can also select the element type, the beam type. Maybe you want to model a 3D structure as beams because that's all you need. 
maybe you have to select 3D solids. You can also apply loads and boundary conditions. You can select the material model, elasticity, plasticity, composites, isotropic. And the preliminary analysis can be simplified. Uh, you wanna also simplify if you can, once you can simplify the better because analysis procedures using fundamentals can be quite costly. And so you may wanna do sensitivity studies and by not simplifying things and making everything too difficult, you may run into the problem of computational problems and computational inefficiencies. Hand calculations should always be done to compare, to make sure your analysis models are good in terms of units, that things are making sense. You also wanna make sure you exaggerate the deformation in the, in the CAD model, in the abacus model, in the post-processing software to make sure that when things are deformed, everything makes sense. We've seen situations where pressure was supposed to be applied, but nothing was moving. Well, clearly you have a problem with the model. You wanna make sure that solutions make physical sense. You wanna compare the preliminary analysis and experiments, think and evaluate and revise and refine as much as necessary to gain confidence that what you've done is accurate. In summary, the finite element method is a numerical technique for solving a wide range of complex physical phenomena, particularly those exhibiting geometrical and material nonlinearities. These problems can be a structural in nature, <coughs> thermal, electrical, magnetic, and acoustics. You can tackle problems that are not possible to do with analytical treatments. And continuous domains are decomposed into discrete connected regions. And they're connected using nodes. And these discrete regions are called elements. You can assemble these elements together to then solve. This initially was partial differential equation, but now we turn the problem into a linear algebra problem. Here's an example. I have a physical phenomenon. The physical phenomena could be solid mechanics, fluid mechanics, thermal conduction, diffusion, and electrical conduction. I have a governing equation that represents a physical phenomena, perhaps, and you can see they all look the same, but the variables are changing and the meanings of this coefficients is changing. Yet I can use an approximation to these solutions by discretizing the domain, and by discretizing the domain, subdomains, the domain into subdomains, an approximate solution over the subdomain, we're able to then approximate the solution and turn this problem into a finite element number of equations, which is going to look like KU equals F. F is usually known, K is known, invert K to find U, the nodal vector. Here U could be any of this, uh, deflection, pressure, and so forth, temperature for heat transfer. U can be whatever you want it to be in this column. Here's an example of a problem of a square with temperature applied on three edges and a different temperature applied on the fourth edge. The diff partial differential equation looks like this. The temperature is specified as follows, as you see here, but that's not the point. I I'm not here to solve this analytically because that's not the point of this course. The point of this course is to show you that I can take this complicated analytical solution. And instead of solving for that complex analytical solution, I wanna find a different way of doing it. Now you can see how this is very complicated to solve. And what if this was a different shape? Maybe it was a semicircle or a triangle or something else. I want to find a way of doing this approximately. So instead of that, I'm gonna cross it. I don't wanna find an analytical solution. Perhaps I can divide the domain into small subdomains. And these small subdomains are called elements, and these triangles are connected to each other through nodes. I want to take this equation, this partial differential equation, discretize in this, in this manner, apply the material properties, the loads, and everything else, the boundary conditions, and then this is going to turn, this discretization process is going to turn the problem into kt equals q, where k is a matrix of, unknown, of known values, you know that one, the temperature is not known, and the Q, the heat fluxes are basically probably known. Maybe they're not known, who knows? But you can invert this equation by, by pre-multiplying this equation by K inverse and calculating the temperatures. Once you know temperatures, you know the heat fluxes, you can use it for design purposes.
So the basic fine element procedure is to discretize the continuous body into elements, approximate the local behavior of elements in terms of discrete degrees of freedom, and pass together or assemble elements to form a global system of algebraic equations and solve for discrete degrees of freedom. Coming up next, we'll be covering the simple finite elements with springs. So the topics discussed in this book are covered um, in several uh, locations. So what we covered kind of in a very top level is uh, the chapter one, uh, with a, there's a lot more information here, but I give, give you the basics for it. Um, and I talked a little bit about verification validation in a lot more detail here. Uh, we also covered the kinds of elements you can have and mesh sensitivity studies. So I'm just kind of walking through it. Um, and also we cover linear nonlinear properties, uh, structure analysis applications, equations that matter in solid mechanics. And also, we cover the equation for heat transfer in general in chapter one. And then chapter two, we move to differential equations and how, how we approximate those equations. That, that'll be coming up later. But the, the topic that's going to come is going to come up next will be spring elements. And that's covered in chapter three of the book. And that's here. I'm trying to get to it. We give a lot of examples in the book, which makes it very easy to kind of uh, practice. Um, a lot of the problems I'll be giving are not coming from the book, but they could be useful. So here you're gonna see the idea of springs um, here, and that's what com is coming up next, the idea of that. So I just wanna kind of give you the uh, top level view, what chapters we're in so that you can, you can kind of uh, follow along, okay?